Okay. Welcome everyone. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Welcome to the, um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the Cody Institute and St. Francis Xavier University where this webinar is being hosted, are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. These treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established guidelines for an ongoing relationship between nations. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone who is joining us today from around the world. I am Robin Neustader, an assistant professor in the Faculty of, of Ed Education at St. Francis Xavier University, and I'm also program teaching staff at the Cody International Institute. As well, I am a mother, aunt, neighbor, and advocate for peace and just gender justice. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat your name, organization, institute, and country. As of an hour before start time, there were nearly 100 people registered from 34 different countries. Your interest in, the, in this event validates the importance of this topic and the roles and work of and with males in gender equality. Since November 25th, we have been marking the international 16 days of activism against gender violence recognizing that working for gender equality is complex, complicated, compassionate, and caring work. It is about societies, communities, families, and individuals of all genders addressing the harmful and hurtful ideas and actions that perpetuate gender violence and exploring and adopting new ideas and actions that support respect, care, and justice for all so that all may live full and abundant lives. The COVID-19 pandemic has heightened and exacerbated the challenges and realities of gender-based violence around the world. The rise in gender-based violence during this pandemic is referred to by the UN as the shadow pandemic. In April, 2020, here in Nova Scotia, the mass murder of women, men, and children was committed by a man with a history of domestic violence. Today, we gather to listen to examples of how people are engaging male youth in gender equality. I would like to ask Gord Cunningham, Executive Director of the Cody International Institute, to share some words. Thank you, Robin, for the opportunity. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, Robin, the first thing I want to do is thank you for organizing this event. Um, I think it's incredibly important. Um, you know, as part of the 16 days of that international 16 days of act as activism against gender based violence. Uh, this is a very heavy time. Um, you mentioned the events in Nova Scotia in April um, in Canada. Um, all Canadians are aware of December 6th and its significance as the day of memorial. Um, a very tragic event that occurred many years ago where women in an engineering faculty were targeted by a man. Um, the, so I think it's incredibly important. Um, I have a personal, uh, I mean, I identify with this issue very personally as a father, as you mentioned yourself as a mother, I have two men, uh, two young men as sons and a daughter. And uh, I have a history in my family, uh, which I've never really spoken about before. Uh, with a sister who was, who was, who had very, uh, was very, violently uh, treated by a former boyfriend and who went on to uh, run a shelter in Toronto. And so uh, I'm all too aware of, of the importance of this issue and the importance of males in taking responsibility and in shifting their behavior. And so engaging young males uh, is, is very, very important. It's not just a matter of, 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 uh, of males at large, young males, I think are, are the real key. And I think that this kind of a webinar um, and the kind of audience we are attracting for this around the world and here locally is incredibly important. I'm delighted that we have a panel that represents both local and global for, for those of us here. We have 
um, colleagues, two colleagues from the Faculty of Education located in the building right behind me on the screen here, uh, Chris and, and Mo. Um, we have a, a partners of Cody who are new, like um, uh, Care Canada, uh, Care Zimbabwe, uh, through Care Canada partnership on the Start for Girls project with Charity, who I've never met but can't wait to. Um, uh, we have new uh, colleagues, people we're getting introduced to, in, in my case, for the first time, people like Prabhu, Ipan, and Tirfa in Sri Lanka. Uh, and it's wonderful to see graduates like Smita uh, Dara, coming back, even if it's only virtually from the Global Change Leaders Program, and to have longstanding partners of partners, such as um, Sandrine from uh, y YWCA in Haiti, who is the partner of our longtime partner, Clay, or the Center for Leadership and Excellence. So for all these reasons, I'm, del I'm, I'm delighted that, uh, and, and thank you, Robin, for organizing this uh, on this very, very critical issue. And I, I, have, I can only stay for an hour, unfortunately, but I'll be riveted for that hour and um, I really look forward to it. So thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending and thank you panelists and thank you, Robin, for organizing. Thank you, Gord. I'm now going to turn to our speakers, which is the real reason that we're um, all here today. And um, so our presenters span the globe and the beauty of technology and Zoom these days is that we can all gather virtually to hear from such great practitioners. We will start here in Nova Scotia with Dr. Chris Gillum and Mo Green. So Chris, Gillum is an associate professor in the Faculty of Education at St. Francis Xavier University, where he teaches in education leadership, inclusion, and mental health education. His research focuses on mental health literacy, girls' development, adult assets, and healthy living projects for boys in grades seven and eight. Mo Green recently retired from the Nova Scotia Department of Health and Wellness, where he was coordinator for youth health. He's worked with youth for almost 40 years across a wide range of youth health issues. His most recent work with government and post-retirement focuses on men's health, looking at how the pressures and expectations around masculinity are impacting the health of young men. So Chris and Mo, I, oh, I hand it over to you. Thanks very much, um, Robin. And I'm going to ask Kate to let me know if I've successfully shared the screen so I can start the presentation. I can see your presentation. Awesome. Thanks, folks. Really appreciate the opportunity. As Chris mentioned in, uh, in uh, when I typed, I'll be taking the lead on the presentation. but. Chris will butt in if I say anything stupid or, or uh, inaccurate. So thanks very much. Um, we're going to be talking about guys' work that has largely found a home with grade nine guys in our province. But more recently, as of last year, we started work with grade seven or eight guys as well as part of the new project. Uh, we call the work guys' work. And it started because of a, a challenge that we had in our healthcare system in Nova Scotia. In, in our province, we have 50 youth health centers in the high schools. This is part of the healthcare, healthcare system inside the school. And we evaluated them and we knew that these uh, health centers were effective, but we also knew that guys were not using them. And we wanted to figure out a way to increase guy traffic to the youth health centers. So in 2012, we recruited a local junior high school, middle school, and received permission to take all of the grade nine guys, 40 of them in three separate classes, into um, uh, a gendered uh, health class every week. So this was part of instructional time, but it was uh, just the guys. And um, what we wanted to do was give them a whole bunch of lessons in the gendered space. I worked with the Ministry of Education here and created lessons that tied to provincial um, outcomes for grade nine health. And you can see the list of, of subjects that we covered. It's not in, uh, inclusive, but everything from sexual violence and consent to healthy eating and physical activity, just et cetera, et cetera, just went on and on. Uh, there was no formal evaluation that first year, but we were trying to reduce the stigma around help seeking. And what we found at the end of the school year was that 20% uh, of the guys stepped up to ask for help with a wide variety of youth health issues, which was great. And when we asked ourselves why that was happening uh, in the absence of a formal evaluation, 
uh, we felt that it was because of two things. It was because of the lesson plans that we created and the facilitation style that was happening within our little circles in the schools. Uh, first, the lesson plans. We did away with all the conventional bells and whistles of, of, of most classrooms. So no YouTube videos, no PowerPoint presentations, no lectures, no worksheets. It was simply a bunch of guys in a circle with some papers on the floor. And what we were trying to do each week was to put the guys through some sort of experience that led to a place of conversation and reflection. The second piece was the facilitation style, which is really, really focused on listening to the young people um, in a non-judgmental way and in a space that was safe and, and fun for them uh, on a weekly basis. And the early evaluation results in years two and three told us that we were successfully shifting attitudes around help seeking, which is great. So uh, I want to kind of shift gears and talk about surfacing the counter narrative. But what I mean by that is that there's this, uh, if you've ever heard of the man box before, part of the man box or the script of masculinity says that guys don't ask for help, it's a sign of weakness. And what we showed through these classes is that we were able to shift an attitude that guys did not see help seeking as a sign of weakness. It was actually just kind of a normal thing uh, to do. Uh, in terms of surfacing the counter narrative, we see masculinity uh, as often a performance. And we know that guys can perform helpful as well as harmful identities. And we want guys to feel comfortable displaying masculine identities that are more authentic. But at the same time, we want guys to feel comfortable supporting the authentic identities of their male peers. So I'm going to show some slides and hopefully try to illustrate this in a more wholesome way. So for example, we want guys to feel comfortable and supportive not misusing alcohol. So there's two kind of distinct things in here. There's the young man who feels comfortable not misusing alcohol, but that comfort is further reinforced by his male friends supporting that decision, if that makes sense. For example, we want guys to feel comfortable and supported being something other than a jock. We want guys to feel comfortable and supported with a gender expression that doesn't align with typical masculinity. We want guys to feel comfortable and supported not being players. We want guys to feel comfortable and supported expressing how much they care about uh, one of their male friends. And of course, we want guys to feel comfortable and supported asking for help with a health issue. So. I want to play a very short testimonial from a former student of mine, Josh, who was part of the pilot year. Um, listen to it. It's only about 20 seconds long. And then I want to mention something at the end. Yeah, you know, I can look at my friend. I can look at Ezekiel. I can look at uh, Trino. I can look at those two. And I can see in their face when they're not having a good day or when something's wrong. And, you know, instead of ignoring it or not being scared to say anything or not having the confidence, I, now I can, you know, I can see it and I say something and make the space for that. So Josh is a very warm-hearted, um, loving, caring man. But the man box says that he's not allowed to sort of open up that tender side of him, especially to his male friends. And uh, Guy's group taught him that he could show that authentic side of him. And it not only helps Josh, but of course, uh, thinking about the quote, it's helping his two best friends as well, which is amazing. Yeah, you know. So guys really need these safe spaces to explore masculinity and reflect on the identities that they present. But there is a challenge. The competition to define the identity of young men is very, very powerful. So when we think about the influence of pop culture and those subcultures of porn culture, sports culture and gaming culture, when we think about advertising and marketing and even the messages within families and peer groups, as well as the uh, specific culture within a specific community, we can, begin, we can begin to appreciate how tough the competition is for these messages. And so when I think about the guys that I've taught over the last uh, eight plus years, you know, they love these sessions. They actually run to the classes to make sure they can be there at the, the beginning of the classes. But this work in grade nine and the new work just for some guys in grade seven and grade eight, it's not enough. We need a sustained investment in this work over different ages and stages of guys' lives. It's pretty easy to transfer knowledge. I can create a kick-ass lesson that does that pretty easily. And I think we can do a pretty good job nudging some attitudes and maybe changing some attitudes over the short, uh, over the short term. But changes in behavior, that's more elusive. That's really, really difficult to do. So for Dr. Gillum and I, our vision is to have spaces in elementary, middle, and high school for important conversations that highlight masculine identity 
as a key factor in the health of young men, as well as a factor connected to gender-based violence. So why is this approach promising? We feel it's very youth-centered. There's a real emphasis on listening to youth and amplifying their voice. It's a pedagogy that works with boys, and Chris could explain this in a more articulate way than me, but we know that boys are often relational learners and they learn best in environments where there's a very strong relationship uh, with a mentor, a role model, a teacher, a facilitator. We also feel that this uh, approach is highly scalable and, and hopefully low cost because we're using um, existing resources in the system. We're using instructional time and we're using teachers and other school-based professionals to do the work. And if we see this vision come to fruition with these spaces in elementary, middle school, and high school, Chris is hopefully going to tell us uh, how effective the approach and the work is. Before I kind of wrap up, there are two strategic considerations. Uh, it's a challenge to create a competent and confident group of facilitators, people who are not just competent and confident with the, uh, with the content and the approach, but also competent and confident working with young men, which is a skill set unto its own. And of course, the other strategic consideration is to make sure that we have ongoing research and evaluation. It's a dynamic world. We need to measure changes, but also to inform the evolution and the content of the approach. So I know there's going to be space at the end for, for questions, and uh, I believe you'll be sharing uh, contact information for Chris and I, but uh, hopefully we'll hear from you not only comments and critiques and questions, but just your honest feelings about uh, what we're doing here in Nova Scotia. Thanks very much. And Kate, if I can ask you for your expertise and stop sharing the, uh, the screen, thanks. Thank you, Mo. And um, Mo and Chris, please feel free to share your um, contact information in the chat as well. Um, okay. Now we're going to travel south from Nova Scotia to Haiti. Uh, Sandrine Canalverner works as a psychologist with young boys and girls in Haiti both in private practice and with the YWCA, um, providing psychological and psychosocial support and self-esteem workshops. Since 2011, she has also served as the YWCA Haiti's General Secretary. And since July of 2012, she's the coordinator for the Adolescence Girls Initiative and AGI, a program financed by the World Bank. So Sandrine, if you are, I think I saw you come in. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Oh, now I can't. There we go. Now I see you again. Oh, but I'm not, you're, I think you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Is it good now? So now I can hear you, but I cannot see you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I'm so sorry about that. That's okay. I have to, um, it's only 9.15 in Haiti, so I think there's a time difference. I was waiting for 10 a.m. Yeah, there's a time difference. Yes, I'm so That's sorry. Okay. And, That's uh, okay. Um, Sandrine, if we can hear mm -hmm. you, you can go ahead. Okay, it's perfect. Okay, good. So uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to be part of this group. I'm Sandrine uh, from the YWC of Haiti. And I'm going to present the, the institution. So the YWC of Haiti has been um, working for the past 10 years in at-risk communities in Haiti. And uh, we offer services for young girls and young women um, in a very uh, vulnerable situation. And uh, the YWCA, do you hear me? Hmm. Yes, I hear you. Okay, perfect. Yeah. The YWCA Haiti goal is to promote the leadership of women and girls in Haiti for them to contribute to the development of their own communities and country at large. So our main focus is on three key issues, education, health, and leadership. And when we say education, we talk about formal education, which is academic education, and non-formal education, which is mainly life skills education. 
Um, the vision of the YWCA Haiti is the one of uh, a world without exception in which uh, peace, health, human dignity, freedom, and the preservation of the environment are promoted and supported through women's leadership. And within that, we have uh, also a, a personal mission, um, which is to develop the leadership of women and girls for them to become agents of change and uh, have the power to create positive changes in their lives at first, their communities at a, a bigger plan and at a larger plan in their country. So through various programs, we've been working uh, towards our goal for the past 10 years, and we've seen a lot of change. We've had a lot of results, and we have had a lot of impact in various communities. But to come to the, the basis of uh, this um, conversation today, which is the work, the empowerment of boys and men at a larger scale, we've realized in the past that um, it was hard for the YWCA to reach our goals and it was very challenging since we were only targeting girls and young women. So the education was done, the, the reinforcement was done, the, the sharing of tools was done with these girls and young women. However, the work became more and more difficult because we did not consider uh, giving the same education to young boys and young men. And about three years ago, uh, we have decided with the support of the World YWCA, we have decided to have a pilot program in a very at-risk community, in a community that is uh, literally led by gang leaders. And when I mean gang leaders, we have 12-year-old uh, boys who are gang leaders and armed. And we have decided to test a, a pilot program in this community. And we have uh, give the, the, the support, education, and all the programs, psychosocial support to the, the young girls in this community, but also at the same time to young boys who were mainly gang leaders. And I have to say that this was a life-changing experience for us, and this is where we realized that in order to, to, to tackle gender-based violence, in order to have a bigger impact with our programs, we have to educate both male and female. And uh, since then in this community, we've been there for three years now, we've seen a lot of changes in these young boys, in even adult gang leaders. And we've seen that educating them, re reinforcing them and um, teaching them other ways uh, to be powerful outside of being a gang leader, outside of having guns, um, but giving them education, presenting them opportunities, giving them education on uh, uh, financial literacy, um, helping them uh, conduct projects, put projects together and have their own financial projects. So we realized that the impact was enormous. And so this is why we have accepted to be part of this conversation today because um, we know that our main goal is to educate and reinforce girls and young women. However, uh, we've realized that by tackling the same problems in young boys, the, the impact is better. And when we, we, we look at young women who have probably relationships with these gang leaders, they say that the, the messages, the education they get from the YWCA when we talk about sexual and reproductive health, when we talk about gender-based violence, they say that the impact is greater than they could ever imagine to have a conversation with their partner, with their husband, and to, to make sure that the, 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 the goal that we want to have for them to be comfortable in their relationship, for them to talk about gender-based violence, the goal is greater when we educate both male and female at the same time. Thank you, Sandrine. That, that's great to hear about the learning of the YWCA and, the, and, and pivoting to also include um, young males and, and young gang leaders in the project. Um, okay. Yes. Yes. So we'll have opportunity for questions and discussions after the presentations of our speakers. Perfect. Yes. 
Thank uh, you very much. Thank you so much, Sandrine. I'm so pleased to, for everybody who has been here to present today. Um, and so now we are going to travel across the Atlantic Ocean to Zimbabwe. And we're going to hear from Charity Regube, who I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, Charity, um, who is the Gender Advisor for Care Canada. So Charity, do you wanna test your microphone? I see you're here with us. Hi, Robin. Hello, Charity. Okay. I hope I'll be audible and sorry for the challenges that we are having in terms of uh, the internet. So I'm also trying to share my screen. Okay. Yeah, it started. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to also share our experience uh, in implementing um, uh, activities that actually engage our males. So for for starters, um, I'll also give um, the background of our project. Um, I'm actually supporting uh, the project, the gender specialist for a girls education project, which is actually implemented in Zimbabwe. It's a new project and we are still in our initial uh, uh, phases. So by, by, by name, the project is entitled Supporting Transition, Attendance, Retention and Training for Girls to include uh, training for the young women. So in terms of our operational space, um, we are in Manikaden province and we have presence in two districts, which are rural uh, communities. And in terms of the context, uh, our communities, um, they have actually high prevalence in terms of uh, social norms. They are also districts where they are also experiencing um, high levels of poverty unemployment is also very high for the young people. And the two districts have also been experiencing drought and they were also exposed to the impact of uh, Cyclone Idai. And currently we are also experiencing challenges uh, in relation to COVID-19. And then the question would come to say, why uh, male engagement in our programming? So uh, by virtue of the name where we are saying supporting transition for girls are uh, basically people, the question that would also come to mind is where they would also say, what about boys? So our uh, strategies where we are saying, we really need to ensure that we challenge the harmful uh, gender uh, norms and we require men, boys uh, and, uh, and youth is uh, agents of change. And uh, the other reason is that we really uh, want to ensure that we manage backlash which might also arise, especially when people are also going to be labeling a project to say, this is a project that is basically looking at um, uh, working with uh, girls and only young women. So backlash is one of the critical pieces that would also want to ensure that we really engage young, uh, uh, young men so that uh, they also support um, uh, our programs. So working for, with uh, youth for us is also very critical. And we've also realized uh, from other similar uh, projects in Zimbabwe that uh, they are really hand when it comes to having spaces where social norms are, are reflected upon, where there's also structured uh, platforms for uh, uh, reflections and dialogues and conversations around some of the gender norms that are also likely to affect you know, the learning of girls to include uh, participation of young women in vocational training and income generating activities. And like uh, the other presenters where we are saying we really need to ensure that we challenge restrictive constructive um, uh, challenges associated with uh, masculinity and femininity, where we really want to ensure that we drive um, gender related uh, uh, activities to really um, uh, address uh, inequalities. So in terms of um, uh, programming, we have three pillars uh, that we are uh, using in order to address uh, the challenges that we've noted. A the first one being social barriers, where the drivers are harmful social norms and self-defeating attitudes, where we have girls who are also likely to say we are not able in certain uh, uh, activities. Hence, we really need to ensure that as a project, we challenge these harmful practices through uh, approaches such as the social analysis and action and um, 
the other uh, pillar being that we really want to ensure that we enhance uh, you know, the agency through platforms that would also seek to empower an individual with skills, knowledge, and um, knowledge for positive behaviors and attitudes. The second pillar is where we are saying in as much as we are working with uh, communities to address harmful social norms, we really also need to be working uh, through schools where we uh, want to facilitate um, uh, uh, sustainable uh, environments. And like I've also indicated that some of the community uh, communities have also experienced, they have, they've actually experienced um, uh, shocks uh, related to drought, shocks related to cyclone Idai. So we are also working through schools to also ensure we facilitate uh, schools to be prepared for any shocks and also would use the schools to include the marginalized um, uh, um, uh, group of uh, learners and uh, ensuring that they, we also have uh, enabling environments that would also take into consideration the participation of young boys through uh, junior uh, school development committees. And uh, through some of the platforms that we also have in schools, we intend to really ensure that we create platforms for advocacy where learners are given an opportunity to really engage in activities that also advocate for their issues. Then the last pillar is also looking at economic barriers. Uh, like I've alluded to, to say some of the challenges are in relation to drought and uh, uh, through um, uh, the, the, the challenges that we also had in terms of employment, the project also seeks to ensure that we facilitate viable VS and O groups, um, income generating activities, and also exposure to vocational trainings, where these activities are also going to be community driven for economic empowerment and enhanced uh, livelihoods. So I will quickly share some of the group uh, good practices that we have also experienced through other um, similar project in Zimbabwe. Um, as project, we also realized that we really need to be intentional uh, by working with our youth for the reasons that I've also shared. We would also be monitoring our context so that we are also responsive and taking advantage of different platforms to ensure that we also amplify the issues that affect our young people. And um, one of the critical pieces is where we would also ensure that we have uh, key messaging for behavior change. And as we will also be implementing, we are also going to be documenting key lessons on new engagement so that we're also able to learn and also replicate. So in terms of platforms, uh, these are some of the platforms that we also have um, noted is uh, strategic uh, um, uh, uh, interventions, especially when dealing with uh, youth. Because with youth, what you really need to ensure is that you uh, use or utilize uh, you utilize uh, platforms where uh, the young people would uh, be mobilized, where they would actually have meaningful engagement. So some of the activities that we anticipate to roll out through lessons from um, uh, projects like I've also shared is, we are also going to ensure that we use our red shows for campaigns. We would also use sport as a tool for development because this is one of the problems that we have also realized that youth, they really want to be engaged in those platforms. And in our communities, we have also realized that when it comes to sports uh, like soccer, that's where we are also going to really uh, uh, engage um, and mobilize uh, uh, youth and we have an opportunity to also um, uh, embed uh, some of the critical issues like uh, um, where we would also engage youth on dialogues around HIV and AIDS and other sensitive issues that affect the young people to include uh, having conversations around economic uh, ventures and reproductive issues. We are also going to be using text messages so that we would also be sharing key messages with our young people in our different communities. Youth platform is one of the critical pieces that we have also realized is uh, very strategic so that we would also create um, uh, spaces or safe spaces with youth and have our dialogues um, around the issues that affect them. We have also noted that camps and clubs are really critical, especially when, when you really want to ensure that you target young people in those spaces where they are also uh, involved in diversity activities. So for us, it's not only looking at uh, some of the key critical issues like uh, HIV and AIDS, they also need to be exposed to 
uh, other diverse uh, uh, activities like uh, playing sports. Um, we are also going to ensure that we take advantage of commemorations like the International Youth Day. Uh, and currently we have been um, participating in uh, also commemorating the 16 days of activism. And we see this as an opportunity to also raise uh, issues that affect our young people. Peer-to-peer -peer is learning groups that we would also facilitate as a project to ensure that we provide spaces where youth have uh, to exercise their agency as they um, are engaged in activities that affect them. We are also thinking of so changing uh, sports and arts personalities because you know sports and arts those are some of the critical uh, strategies that young people would also require. So we are thinking that by having sports and arts uh, you know uh, role models in our platforms, that on its own is a way of also mobilizing our 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 youth. And lastly, we envisage to include uh, young men in alternative livelihoods because we know as a project. We really need to empower young people, especially young mothers in village uh, savings and loans. And without the support and involvement of young men, we, we anticipate to see some uh, gender related um, um, uh, challenges and yes, they need to ensure that as uh, young men, they are also part and parcel as well to facilitate uh, platforms for income generating activities. I think that's our experiences. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charity, for outlining the thinking and strategies um, that have gone into developing the Start for Girls project. I know um, as somebody at Cody who's going to be who is working on that, I'm very excited. And and it's absolutely true that um, the engagement of, of, of everybody, you know, is for the benefit of everybody. So thank you so much. So now we are going to travel from Zimbabwe up to Sri Lanka, where we find Prabhu Deepan, who is the head of Tier Fund UK's global thematic support team, and he is based in Colombo. He is the architect of Tier Fund's evidence-based transforming masculinities intervention, a faith-based approach on gender equality and positive masculinities, which is being implemented in 12 countries, including the project includes adaptations focusing on family planning. So Prabhu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robin. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Prabhu. Uh, yeah, it's evening here in Sri Lanka, uh, and I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. And I think I want to acknowledge that, you know, back in 2010, when I started on this journey of, you know, working on engaging men, you know, uh, what I had in mind is very much different to what, where I am right now. And I will talk a bit more about, you know, as I go through the intervention. Uh, I started, uh, you know, looking at this intervention I'm going to be talking about was developed as a, a response to sexual and gender based violence. Uh, Tier Fund had just started to kind of focus, ex you know, very specifically on sexual violence in conflict, uh, starting in DRC, Rwanda and Burundi. and. Uh, and we always start our interventions with uh, this exercise called listening exercise with survivors and really centering our work with survivors of sexual violence. And among many other things, one of the things that they said was, why are you only talking to us? What about the men and boys? Uh, what about, uh, and the framing was, what about those who do this to us in that sense at that time? And Tier Fund you know, was really interested in exploring what that could look like in, for their work and for our work now. Um, exploring the intersections of, you know, uh, engaging men and boys in, in response to sexual violence, but also within a faith context, you know, predominantly faith influenced communities. And in this context, it was very predominantly Protestant Christians. So I started in 2013 uh, with Tier Fund really trying to understand what could this look like? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, yes, I can. Okay, thank you. What could this work really look like if you took on the intersection of uh, what it means to be a man or masculinities uh, at that time and how do we engage with them and specifically within a faith context where social and gender norms are shaped and influenced by uh, text and interpretation of scriptures etc in that context and sometimes in very harmful ways as well that you know kind of reinforces this idea of subordination of women inferiority uh, which leads to you know uh, really uh, reinforcing patriarchal values and norms and systems and then you know obviously gender-based violence as a result 
Um, so as I started on in, a, in, in the formative research, it was evident that whatever model that we developed, we needed to engage in, you know, with the, within the framework and parameters of text as well. Uh, you know, people wanted to understand what, you know, in addition to it being a human rights issue and it, about equality, etc. What did the scriptures say? You know, they, that that needed to be addressed. And most often that became the um, challenging sticky point in that sense. And we developed this program with the idea that, you know, whatever we did, we needed to address this recurring uh, scriptural uh, references that people kept using around creation and, you know, how, uh, and then around subordination and submission and, you know, uh, stories like that. Uh, and I also realized that it needed to be a process and it's not necessarily a workshop that you're looking at, you know, uh, the incentive for, you know, joining a program that I would put together would be like three days of a workshop and a, a, no a notebook and a pen and a bottle of water and maybe meals. Uh, the, the message that re gets reinforced week in, week after, every day for the rest of our lives is very much different. In, in this context, it is also this premise of, you know, your spiritual your well-being and, you know, afterlife and things like that. So really putting people at this conflicting position is not going to be working for any of us. And I think it needed to be really aligning with what people understood as what their faith and parameters and what the faith says, etc. And, and there was this other element, and this man told me in Burundi after one of those, uh, fo you know, focus group discussion around uh, this, is that he said, Prabhu, I've never seen a man be anything other than what I have seen that is violent, uh, that is reinforcing all these things that you're talking about. I have never seen my father do it. How can I be something I have never seen? So it was really evident at that point that whatever model that we developed, it needed to engage with this aspirational thing, a role modeling of sorts. So, uh, I, you know, developed, uh, you know, this uh, thing called transfer masculinities, you know, back in the day, also because it really needed to be meaningful to me as a man as well. You know, I think this is a critical part of the work that I will talk about as a key principle. It needs to remain meaningful to you and therefore it creates meaning for the communities that you work with. Uh, this was not designed as a, you know, very specifically with young males at that point. And, uh, you know, the adaptation is with the young males and I'll talk very briefly about it if I have time. But this was really how it started. Uh, and it was evident very quickly that you can't just talk with men and boys. You needed to bring in women and girls as well because these norms and values and uh, principles and you know, expectations are not just what men and women, uh, men and boys had, but there was an expectations and these norms were also kept by men and women and girls as well. You know, like I always say, like in my brother's house, whenever there's a snake and his wife will be like, Praveen, can you go and, you know, the snake, he's like, why should I die? <laughs> you know, the snake will bite and both of us will die equally. So this expectation of what it means to be a man, I think it's really something to think about. So you need, can't just engage with men who go back home and say, Prabhu, you know, I try to be part of the household work because I want to be part of it. But then I get ch got chased, ch chased out because she said, this is my space. Uh, or the mother-in-law or the mother would say, what are you doing? You've turned my mm, son into a woman now. You know, so I think thinking about the wider space in the society that we live in also is really important. So the, the importance of changing knowledge and behavior and attitudes, but also the importance of changing social, social environment and norms that enable and reinforce some of these harmful practices as well. So uh, we, so this transfer masculinities is a, a three-tiered kind of intervention model. So we work with faith leaders and communities not as instrumentalization of faith leaders, but really acknowledge their men mostly, and, and therefore they need to be on this journey for themselves as well. Because um, if you believe in equality, you will preach equality, you know, uh, if otherwise it's, it's unhelpful, you give them a toolkit and they, you know, preach and then they, their behavior is completely different and therefore it reinforces exactly the same thing that they're trying to kind of challenge and acknowledge their allies uh, there's in, you know, within the faith groups as well and for their own journey. And then therefore they then recruit uh, men and uh, one man and woman and minimum as gender champions we are they are trained facilitators who then facilitate a, a, a dialogue for six weeks at, with men and women from the co congregations uh, eight to ten uh, men eight to ten women in single sex groups for five weeks two hours a week and then six hour six week they come together ready to have a conversation uh, but while acknowledging these things uh, you know in their own uh, you know uh, weekly sessions so the toolkits that I've written uh, focus on the six weeks separately for men and women. For women, it's slightly more about affirming of you know value and you know uh, potential and things like that. For men, it's more about challenging around you know privilege, power, and really putting the unequal power at the core of how we un under undertake or engage on this issue. 
because I've realized that there is, this is not about teaching men and women how to use power well. This is about working towards dismantling or you know, addressing unequal systems because unless you do that, there is no way you can in gender-based violence. So it's really important to talk about this uh, inequality as a framing of a gender-based violence work. And I think that was really important for me. I and mean, that's a huge learning for me, you know, not prescrip prescribing what gender equal behaviors would mean, uh, but really thinking about where does it come? Can we challenge the values that are assigned to, uh, you know, based on role, you know, uh, gender and can we, ch you know, challenge the roles that are assigned based on these values as well. So really, and then re renegotiating that because people would, and so when I started, as I said, you know, back in 2010, it was around fatherhood and caregiving and which was all great, but felt un, you know, unhinged from this core belief of that we are equals. And the need, you know, because I always say, you know, my father used to be a great cook, but also didn't prevent him from beating my mother up. You know, there was no value. He didn't see her as a human being. And I think it's really important that, you know, whatever that comes is a, as a result of this inherent belief that we are equal. So that's just kind of the aim of the transfer masculinist intervention. And, you know, this is now in 12 countries, we have an adaptation for young adolescents and including family planning, et cetera. The most exciting piece of this work has been, you know, the evidence that came out of the UK funded project in DRC, in Ituri province, a very rural conflict affected area, 15 villages, uh, you know, between uh, baseline and inline, we've seen 60% reduction of intimate partner violence, and also 83% reduction of non-partner sexual violence. Uh, and we are starting to see shifts in terms of uh, not only behavior at the household level, but also really seeing that is trickling down to the wider society. And I think this is, comes to the point of social norms. It is not always proportionate to the shift on attitudes. And I think that's really important to think about like the, the you know, the, the how well this knowledge uh, of uh, is embedded in you it takes a long time to undo. But when social norms shift, where violence becomes the exception and not the norm, it, it you know, reinforces and shapes behavior. And I think that's kind of what we are at now. We've seen a significant drop in terms of violence, but not necessarily uh, the attitudes you know, related to that. So we've seen about 20% reduction of how people look at women, uh, but not, you know, so I think it's really important to acknowledge that this work is deeper and needed uh, you know, longer term. We also are trying to get to gender equality. You know, we use SGBV as an entry point, but really our pro, you know, work is around uh, getting to you know, gender equality. And I think it's really important that the personal commitment and willing to change and the personal reflection for everyone who's involved in is key. And it is actually a critical part of this intervention. We call this a community activism based model in the sense that everyone needs to believe whether it is the pastor or the you know, gender champion or the project officer or myself, at each level that this meaning work is really important and accountable practices. The, just because I acknowledge my power and privilege as a man doesn't mean I, you know, it goes out. You know, it is being a conscious process that is really important. And I think this is the same principle for our work with the young people as well, is really creating that space to have the conversations for themselves, create space for their nuanced experiences, but also to bring people together in terms of understanding and you know, interacting with each other in, in, in understanding and you know, how harmful um, expressions of masculinity is, is really harmful for themselves and other people around them. And I think not shying away from addressing power. You know, I think sometimes I find that engaging men work that really shies away from accountable practices or, or engaging on power, you know, because we feel like if we do that, there's no incentive. People feel like if you have to give up power, I think it needs to be really working at addressing that root causes of that. Otherwise it just reinforces, like for example, my work with faith leaders could add another layer of reinforcing over women's life saying, I want to protect you like South Asia, you know, women are very revered. Like, you know, we have thousands of goddesses, but still they're snuffed out. Their life is snuffed out because in the, all in the name of their honor and share, you know, protection, et cetera. So I think it's really important that we are conscious about that. Role modeling is important. And I guess challenging harmful norms and reinforcing positive gender norms is really critical for this model. This is kind of, I, you know, I'm happy to share, uh, you know, um, uh, material around it and the you know, curriculum. There are two, uh, uh, two different toolkits and then there are adapted versions. We are now doing trialing this with uh, Islamic and Christian communities in Nigeria and have included a social coercion piece because I believe that how people resolve conflict is very gendered and how people resolve conflict in the interpersonal space also kind of extends to the you know, wider space. But also there's an element of masculinity that, you know, extremists use to mo mobilize and radicalize young people as well. You know, uh, this notion of honor and protect protection that you're, you know, uh, uh, you know grow growing up with can be easily kind of uh, become a, a recruitment point where you know uh, that happens. So yeah, I guess those are things that are uh, where we are right now. Right now, thank you, everyone.
Thank you very much, Pradu. Pradu, it's just so great um, to hear about all the work that Tier 5 UK is doing. And I just want to put out to, to all the presenters today that if you have links to resources or materials that you, would, you are willing to share, please post those in the chat for, for those who are present here today. So finally, we are going to travel from uh, Sri Lanka to India. Dr. Samita Dharmar is a homeopath and a counselor. She currently works as Associate Director of Agon Trust. She is dedicated to safeguarding the vulnerable child's right to safety, protection, and development. She works to ensure that the state takes responsibility for the protection of every child through active engagement with children and partnerships with communities. Smita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everyone. It was great uh, hearing everybody's stories and everybody's view. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it is really important topic what we are discussing and it is very dear to my heart. Uh, I would like to start with sharing the screen. Um, uh, the uh, Angan works at the um, child protection and we work with the children, boys and girls to make them um, empower about um, their own safety, their own um, sessions we take them. So when we work with the boys, it's always difficult. They don't want to listen. They don't want to talk. They want, don't want to sit only. Uh, but it, it is with girls, it is always uh, easier. So there is one curriculum from Mondo curriculum from Brazil. We have Indianized it and Indian context and we started working with them. And when we asked the boys, they said, you know, why you don't sit for the session? They said, nobody talks to us. This is, um, and nobody really hears us. So that's how the idea came. Like, why don't we put together the curriculum or the talks or the conversation for them? We ask them what we would like to hear. And this program is about from the boys to the boys and the for the boys. And they are the creator of this boy talk um, curriculum. And youth leaders who take this up and have, and they are from the all walks of life. Um, they are from cities, neighborhoods, schools, colleges, communities, vulnerable communities, the communities where there is inflict and the vulnerability is there. And they want to talk to uh, boys what they have gone through. And they thought they never had mentor when they were uh, growing up. They thought that they should be, there should be somebody at that difficult point was talking to them. There are so many boys, youth came up and said, we could be that youth host and youth leader. And we could, we want to do this and we want to break this gender norm. We want to challenge it. Unless and until you are safe, you are uh, peace with your gender. You are not going to plan your future. You are not going to plan your future uh, education, vocation, anything. So that is how this gender talk started, the boy talk started. And, and these are done by the youth and we train them. They have in turn have the conversation with others. So I want to uh, share one story of one of the boys. Uh, it was, uh, who is a youth leader for us. And uh, it, it was short um, five years back, how his uh, journey started, how he was uh, instrumental of becoming youth host now. He's talking to boys. Uh, just bear with me. I'll just share the screen for that and um, show the video. Um, So Smita, I can hear something a little bit, but I'm not seeing the video. Yeah. Child labor. Sorry. And through this program, we are trying to address those okay. issues. So I can hear it better now, but I still can't see, couldn't see it. Okay, one second. Okay. I, sorry about that. 
technology. Yes, I know. Uh, is it now? Can see the video? Um, can you can you see the video? No. Smita, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Try try opening the video first and then sharing oh, your screen. Okay. One second. Akash. So open so, the video first, that's okay. And then share your screen and choose the video as the item you wanna share. Yeah, sure, sure, I'm doing that. Mm. That is what I was scared of. Can you see now? Can you see? No, we don't see it. You cannot? No. Okay. It's Smita, not... if we can if we can hear it, that would work too. Okay. Um, so we can hear 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 the young. Yeah. Ones. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Can you hear? Not yet. Ayala, which is the community where he's from. Extortion, robbery, murder. These are, you know, sort of run of the mill. If we are working with the adolescent boys, we can talk about the risks that boys face in their life, which can make their life difficult. For example, child marriage, child labor. And through this program, we are trying to address those issues so that these boys can understand and be alert and aware so that they can make themselves safe and make a better plan for their life. When Vinod started working at Angan, he came from a very similar circumstances and I think they could look up to him. So when he talked to young boys about negotiating difficult things, it made sense. Before Angan... Okay, Samita, we can't hear it anymore. Okay. Um, I can, so I can share the story. I one had second. a conflict with yeah. Stop the video and yeah. uh, I can share the story. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, so okay. Akash, <laughs> um, Akash uh, came to us when he was from the slums of uh, Mumbai, that is a big city. And um, he, they, he had a lot of anger issue and um, he other uh, area where he was living was a conflict area. And that's how he, their peers were all, uh, um, who were in the gangs, who were into drug peddling. And that's the time he started coming to us. And he, started, he one point, he had a big fight. And that time, uh, one of our facilitators told him that, why don't you sit here and talk to us? And that, that moment, that it broke the cycle and it broke the whole idea of the violence and things. He started thinking about it, well, what has happened to me? And then he started reflecting upon himself. Then he said, if I wouldn't have found that um, mentor at that time or somebody advising me at that time, I would have been in jail. I would have been doing something. Now he's become podcaster. He's um, doing the youth host, youth leader work. He's working with the boys. Uh, uh, he could have been astronaut. That's the idea. That's how far he has come in his life. He has changed, opened the whole world to other boys also. And that's the, the boy talk conversation is about, where youths of uh, boy talks are talking about uh, uh, boys can also um, uh, boys can also cry, boys can also do gardening, boys can do get hurt, boys can dance, boys can care, boys feel weak, boys can cook also, boys fail to need to talk to also, boys can sing, they wear pink. 
because it is very difficult time to be growing up as a boy as prabhu was saying as uh, we heard stories from zimbabwe haiti uh, so these are the time where boys needs to be heard and we have to change our reorient how we look at the boys and community how they are doing it um, as we are thinking like how we have to reorient it looking at the girls because boys have different vulnerability different need uh, as girls have to work. so and that has to be uh, understood by boys themselves and communities also the stereotypical way of looking at ma man caste and role of protector provider killing the snake as prabhu was saying as a strong man which, which has to be shifted as you know girls get married of financial security the, the way boys get sent off to work um i have been working with the boys for last 15 years and when i started working my my son was adolescent i could relate that i could see why he is not communicating why he does not like us now why he is pushing me away he is not talking what he wants to do it so that's the time i started working and i saw that first boy syndrome you know the first child boy where they want to just jump from uh, age of 12 to uh 22 they want to sit in the time machine and fly there because they they want to skip the adulthood because they want to earn they want to support they want to be a man every boy i heard their dream was to become a man to earn and the mentor who are there the tom who sitting on the bike the uh, the film star fighting the 10 people there are no role model for them and the vulnerability they face is very different and that's how this youth host started talking to them youth leaders talking to the boys you know the, as you know there is like a suicidal rate sar high in men and india is not a different one um they uh, there are traffic accident they are more for the, uh, more men uh, the boys 88 million boys across the world are in the child labor uh, the child abuse uh, we always think of girls but boys are also abused so here join us we work to heal boys relations with themselves that is what we supposed to there are nine conversation um, where it is safe space for them to talk to them where they embrace their own masculinity embrace the part they want to do it um, and these boys um, the young boys talk to boys regarding challenging the gender norm challenging the male honor challenging their idea societal idea um, how to break the circle of violence how to uh, work uh, violence against women and girls um, how can we have a trusted adult to talk up to them how can we have um, boundaries safety how to care about themselves how to become a caregiver they already are um, how to say hear no and say no also sometimes because i know one of our youth leader he was 12 year old and he was in love that time and he confessed that love and that girl said no and he was ridiculed and he dropped out of school and he said how can girl say no to me i am a man so and his all friends started teasing him so that's how um, he became a drug addict also so he said fortunately he met one future teacher and he mentored him and he came out of it and now he is a youth uh, um leader who's talking to boys and uh, doing work with the boys uh, so these are the nine conversation and it has a challenge into that boys like challenge so um, uh, there are challenge like write a letter to your father you may not give him but write to him whatever you have face whatever you wanted to say you never said it change every every after every conversation there is a challenge thrown to boys and they have to go practice do the homework and come back next time reflect upon their action talk about their thing and that's become their safe space and the space could be anywhere in the shelter home in the community garden or in pavement side by where this youth host held their conversation and they start talking to the boys uh, so this is what we are doing and our philosophy is many boys become men at time and in a way that alienate them from them to encourage boys to develop healthy relations with their masculinity at young age our community leader adapted the promotion curriculum by
and cities of India. We have right now uh, for the last two years we are doing Boy Talk in st six states and we have four partners. Uh, three eighty six youth leader has done this uh, nine conversation with almost four thousand one hundred fifty five boys going to the school, colleges, dropped out, working in the brick lane, migrated. You name it, they have done it. Uh, unreachable boys who are working in dumpster, dump yard. So, what is the end line and baseline says, you know? So, the belief of sole responsibility on by men reduces from 33 to 75 percent. 72-4%, they recognize that they are not the sole uh, breadwinner of this thing. Uh, 53 boys are articulated that they know uh, the laws well. The belief hitting the girls and women is okay drop from 54% to 70 Men cannot take care of children as well as women can. Baseline was 73, where headline became 54 Beliefs such as women should tolerate violence to keep families together uh, came down to 35% from 72%. Men have sole responsibility of financial needs reduced by 82% to 43%. These are the some of the uh, baseline end line we did it with this. So these are the uh, boy talk project where initiative that supported boys by encouraging open conversation. If you want to have, want to know about them more, the conversation about them, uh, I'll, I'm, I'll be happy to uh, give you all. Um, and I'm posting that Akash's, um, uh, what he's doing right now. He's working with uh, boys and recently what he did, he uh, identified one boy who had run away uh, at the age of 16 from 1000 kilometers from Mumbai, which is a vast city. And he came, he was a single uh, parent um, child and he came to um, for a better life in Mumbai. And uh, the city streets are not uh, kind to the young men who has come first time to the city. Akash recognized them and he helped him to went to police station, sat with him for the five hours and made sure that he goes to shelter home and now that boy is reunited with the uh, family. That's the work these youth hosts are doing all over um, our places. And this is what um, uh, the boys need that conversation to have at that tender age where they are lost. The nobody, the father, brother, their friends are not having that conversation where they can listen to them and do it. Uh, so here I'm posting one link. You can go later on and see how things are doing. And I'm and uh, sorry I couldn't play the video. Um, uh, if we have time later on, if you want to see it, I can post the link also. You can watch later on. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Samita. Um, so amazing. And um, I, Samita, just so you know, I did share the link to the Boy Talk project in the chat while you were speaking so people can also see because I feel like I've seen the um, I've seen that video and I think it was through the Boy Talk webpage that yeah. might be there. Yeah, okay, so people can see it there as well. So thank you to all our presenters today. It's um, what a phenomenal array of projects and ideas and practices that you are doing in your communities um, around the world. And um, I'd like to open it up now for um, comments or questions. So if you have a question for one of the speakers, um, please raise your hand or post it in the chat. Or even if the speakers have comments they want to share with each other, please do so. So I'm just looking at the chat here. Um, Okay, so there's a question posted in the chat and I'll read it out um, and this can go to, it looks like it's to all the speakers. So somebody um, posted, it might be from the Facebook live feed. Um, I'm wondering how the panelists respond to the suggestion that to truly break the cycle of violence, we need to reach and engage younger, so pre-adolescent boys and particularly those from families in which they have witnessed and lived through gender-based violence and other forms of violence. 
So to the panelists, um, please, who would like to take that first? Robin, can I respond to that? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> I mean, we our intervention, you know, we don't directly work with children, but I think one of the things, as I said, the adaptation that I was talking about is on family planning with you know newly married couples and first-time parents. Uh, which adaptation is you know the additional two weeks of sessions around uh, family planning, but also around positive parenting um, and you know shared household and male involvement in childcare and also you know uh, prenatal and you know visits etc. So I guess what we are trying to see is that creating an environment, equitable environment for children to be born into uh, among this. Uh, uh, so the first six weeks focus on that part of the conversation. The you know follow up is around this, in in a in a in an attempt to break that cycle. Um, and I we've also seen that that the shift uh, that we see among you know, men and women, older men and women, and you know because I said I most of our work is around uh, adult men and women, uh, we've seen the impact of that around children as well. When we've seen the relationship transform, uh, when men and men start looking at and accepting and you know treating women like as the equals the, the we've seen the shifts in the children's behavior as well and the overall well-being of their household so i guess yeah i, I definitely agree we've look, been looking at you know adapting to sunday school material you know this is one thing that we have been you know exploring and there's this really interesting story called the, the long walk of a girl child to towards freedom or something like that so we are trying to adapt that into a, a sunday school storybook that could accompany children as their parents are going through these processes. So, but definitely something uh, that is important um, in terms of engaging. Great. Is, that, is there another speaker who would like to uh, speak to that question? I know Mo and Chris have been engaging with it in the chat. Speakers are welcome to that too. Sandra, Sandra and I'm wondering uh, from, from the work that you're doing in Haiti, do you have a comment or response on that question on working with younger pre-adolescent males, particularly those who come from homes or where they witness violence? Could you repeat the question for me, please? I got yeah. disconnected. Okay, so the question is, um, how, how to truly break the cycle of violence, you know, work, and we need to work with pre-adolescent boys. So how do we reach them and work with them, particularly the uh, pre-adolescent boys who come from families in which they've witnessed and lived through gender-based violence and other forms of violence. Can I, can I talk, Robin? Bye. Yeah, Bye. sure, go ahead. Uh, okay, so we have lots of boys, oh, yeah. you know, or youth host or alumni who are talking like they have experienced uh, violence at home and that's the only um, the solution they have. Uh, they, they have seen only that's the way they should do it. But once they engage into this gender-based uh, conversation, they embrace their own uh, gender ideas, they, they listen to others, other uh, Folk around uh, things, the, they open up their world, it starts reflecting upon them. And once they start reflecting, it, it, their behavior definitely changes. They definitely think of alternate way of uh, responding. What, how the similar situation, how can I do something differently? They start thinking about that, but we have to give them that opportunity to see the, what are the options they can have, what are the options they can choose. So that's the conversation we should have with these boys and we should have constantly with them. It's not one time thing, regularly talking to them and with the parents, with the community, everybody should be ready to do the, hold that conversation. That's what my experience is. And it definitely breaks the silence. Right, thank you, Sandra. Good. Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Um, okay. So my my answer would to that would be that what how, what what we see what we've seen in our experience is that these young boy pre adolescents young adolescents boys who have grown up in a family where there's a lot of violence this is the only thing they know how and in a country like Haiti where there 
more violent. For example, when we, we work with young men who are not only violent physically towards others, but have access to heavy guns to promote violence and survive uh, with that, uh, the way to tackle it and that has worked for us is to show them other opportunities, like the other panelists said, to give them uh, role models, models, but also to show them other opportunities and teach them other ways to be powerful except for violence. So to, ed to be educated, to educate others. What we've done in the communities is that we've trained a first group of young adolescents, 12 to 13, who had never gone to school. And we trained them on life skills, on soft skills. And what we've done a year after is that we've used this youth, this group of young boys and young adolescent boys to become mentors for younger ones who were seven and eight years old. And we've realized that it empowered them to be useful for others, to be educating others, to have some sort of feel that they have uh, a place in this community and that they get respect from others. And this is one way that we know to tackle it. And also, like we said, also educate the, the role models themselves to, to, to have other ways of behaving towards these boys, to have other ways of behaving within the community itself. But to me, it's a matter of um, giving, them, giving them new opportunities to feel powerful. And when we, one thing, uh, personal experience that struck, that stayed with me, is that when we came in the communities, uh, it's not easy to go in these communities and not bring food or money, but bring education. It's not something that they buy easily. And we, we've started uh, with a focus group. They've allowed us, the, the community members have allowed us to start with a focus group. And when we started talking and they said, well, we don't need that. If you don't bring money, if you don't bring food, this is what we need. If you can't bring that, then we have to leave our community. And one of the gang leaders said, well, what she was saying was very interesting. So I want to hear more about it. And he said, well, ma'am, I have to be honest with you. This is what we want. We don't want pity from you. We don't want pity from the government. We need opportunities. We need skills to know how to live a life in a better way. We're violent, not because we want to, but because this is the only thing that we've been taught. So to me, it all comes to teaching them other ways, but other ways that can feel, make them feel valued and that they have a, 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 a place and a role in their community. Yes, thank you, Sandrine. Uh, one Thanks. of the questions that was posted in the chat is how, how have you had to adapt your programs and your outreach um, due to the COVID, pan COVID pandemic? So I know there's been some comments in the chat, um, but also um, if you want to share um, using your voice as well so that people can hear them, that would be great. If people are logging in from their mobile devices, it's not always so easy to go from the chat to the Yes. To the screen to share. So, um, as Sandra you know, so, um, so <laughs> I also encourage people to to talk as well. So please use the chat and also use our voices. Yeah. So Can adapting to COVID. Yeah. Go ahead, Sandra. Okay. Perfect. So, um, in a country like Haiti, it has been very difficult uh, to adapt in a sense that due to COVID we had to close our centers and we had to stop the activities for about three weeks. And when we closed the activities for three weeks, we, we, we clearly know that it's three weeks of uh, damage being done um, when we're not in the communities and when our youth centers are not open for youth and family to come in and get the services. So, and in a country like Haiti, it's not easy for everyone to have access to internet and to a smartphone. So having Zoom workshops, having um, virtual uh, programs was very, very difficult for us. And uh, I have to say, luckily on our side, the impact of COVID wasn't as big as we expected it to be. So after a month of programs, we were op able to open our centers again, receive the families again, but respecting the, the, the health um, procedures related to COVID, which we're still doing now. Um, but uh, the, it was hard for us. And what we did is we had to have um, a, um, a field agent 
associated with every community that we work in. And we would have our mentors at the, the youth centers. They would come to work um, and we would be, we were able to receive the uh, small groups. So groups of three to four kids instead of groups of 25 to 30 kids. Um, so we were able to do that. And for that, we had, sorry about that. And for that, we had to work uh, Sunday to Sunday to be able to maximize uh, the, the outreach to the communities since we were able to receive them on a smaller scale. But I have to say in Haiti, the challenge was that we had no access. The, the communities that we serve, they have no access or low level access to internet. So the virtual world wasn't really uh, available for us. So we had to decide on other ways to be physically present, but uh, at a, with, a, with smaller groups. Thank you. Samita, how have you adapted the Boy Talk project in COVID? Uh, so similarly, everywhere due to the COVID, the schools are closed, the colleges are closed. So what uh, in uh, some of the places, uh, they have, uh, the teachers have formed the WhatsApp group of the uh, student for online session. So we have approached these teachers to take this boy talk um, uh, sessions with uh, once uh, 15 days with the boys. And, um, and we have in this conversation, small audio visual clips also, which gives them, um, uh, starts the conversation regarding that. And it is in the different languages of um, in the India. So it is easier for the boys to understand from the far away uh, places like, and again, uh, as um, there is an internet challenges, smartphones are the challenges. So um, the, some of the villages have adopted that thing, you know, they have put a loudspeaker or they have got their uh, children into one places or community center where with the social distancing, with the social norms and the wearing the mask, they, they, they put a loudspeaker for the teachers. You know, the teachers are, are doing that and it is, uh, and the youth hosts are going in the small groups and they are talking with the social norms keeping in mind because as you know, there are a lot of COVID cases in India and we are like having the uh, lockdown put uh, implemented sometime the cases go down then again we implement that but the schools and colleges are still closed and uh, uh, so that's the challenge we face but because of this uh, innovative ways of people have adopted it uh, it has helped to reach out to more many boys thank you Smita. um let's just see if charity is still here if she has something she would like to add about the work that, um, oh, it looks like she's dropped off. Okay. Um, there was another question that was put in the chat about, um, let's see if I can find it. So how do you reconcile working with male youth on positive masculinity and possibly different messages they hear within their families? And are they prepared to work as ambassadors to their families and communities or would that force them into a confrontation because of challenging norms? Robin, just to maybe say what I typed in, uh, you know, sure, I thanks. think this is where, thank you. Um, I, I think this is where the work on social norms is important for us. And I think, you know, uh, I remember initially, you know, in the DRC project, men would do everything inside the household but never sweep the front of the house because that's what everyone can, else can see, you know? So I think it's really thinking about how do you try to start shifting the social norms in the society is that this becomes acceptable among families and as, uh, as well. And one of the most interesting pieces of work that we've done around the GBV, uh, you know, the positive masculinities and the family planning uh, young adolescents work that I talked to, talked about in, uh, in Kinshasa and DRC is around diagnosing social norms and, you know, uh, through our consortium passages which is funded through USAID. We've been working with Georgetown University to develop this tool called Social Norms Explorer Exploration Tool, which is really diagnosing who key reference groups for each of these social norms are. I think that was really helpful for us because, you know, we not everything that everyone thinks about a particular thing is important to me, but certain things are important, more important to me because it's this person who's thinking about it, whether it's my parents, whether it's my peer, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a grandmother, 
So I think really understanding so that we can uh, target our intervention in a way, I think that has also been really helpful for us. The diffusion of these messages to the wider society, like I said, you know, initially I was thinking these men and women will go through six weeks uh, with us and then, you know, they go to press on a Friday and they go to you know, church on a Sunday and they hear something countering that every day for the rest of their lives, you know, that's not going to be helpful because we need to shift that message so that it reinforces the positive elements of that. And I think this is where we bring in the key reference group or influential people, including parents and teachers. I think this is a really important part of sustaining this shift in behavior. Otherwise, uh, we've seen in our work with care, uh, you know, we put billboards in Sri Lanka. When I was in Sri Lanka, you know, for a man who's nonviolent and within a, in a few months, he started beating his wife because the pressure was so much in the society, you know, that he couldn't cope with it and he had to prove himself in, in, to be a man in that society. I think it's really important to acknowledge that, you know, that the wider societal norms is a key part of uh, shifting and reinforcing at least change behavior. Um, in our experience, I think that's kind of uh, what I would like to share. Chris or Mo, do you have something you'd like to add to that? Or add to this discussion? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is con uh, contextual sometimes too. Some some boys spend a lot of time with their families and at home. Um, some don't, but I guess we're trying to better prepare them for environments away from those family um, settings. And as Chris mentioned in the chat, there's a lot of tact involved too. Um, uh, they may want to be careful about what what um, messages come home. You know, I'm just thinking in about an hour and a half, I'm going to be at a school um, running a, a circle talking about homophobia. And I can guarantee you in the eight plus years I've been doing this work, that's sometimes not an issue that parents want to hear their kids talking about at school. But um, we're doing it because it's important and it's, and it's connected to all those uh, pieces that people have uh, chatted about today. Thank you. Um, I think we'll just take one more question here, and that is, um, so there's been a lot of talk about, you know, um, transforming and really thinking critically about what, what is, does it mean to be male and, and, and challenging some of the norms and deeply held ideals about what that is and trying to build positive um, more constructive and caring ideas. And so, you know, this idea of becoming a better version of oneself. Um, and all of this kind of falls under um, um, this, these past week and a half around the 16, International 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence. So I'm wondering if each of you of the speakers who is still here can speak directly to what is, you know, one action or one thing that you see coming out of your work that is explicitly addressing violence or is an intervention towards uh, violence against girls or women. Can I uh, speak to that briefly, folks? Yes, go ahead, Mo. We've been, we've been very intentional not to approach this from sort of a bystander training approach and a disrupting approach. We really think that there has to be uh, a much more fulsome foundation around this identity piece first, which I think is going to have multiple effects um, around multiple issues, whether it's uh, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, racism, um, but just generally the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual help of these guys. So if we can get guys to be more authentic in the, um, in the identities that they present, then I think that's going to have far reaching effects, including the, uh, what we hope will be a reduction in gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Robin, um, just to say that our intervention is pretty much focused around responding to gender-based violence. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, that if we are truly to see a world that women and girls are not at risk or vulnerable to violence, whether it's in their home, churches, community, schools, workplaces, everywhere, it need, you know, we need to address gender equality, we need to address inequality, we need to engage with uh, uh, these forms of masculinity that is toxic and promote alternatives. Uh, so I guess our work, day-to-day uh, -day commitment in this work is that we want to see violence prevented. Uh, we've seen reduction, but to truly eliminate it, we need to see, you know, work towards that ideal where there's not unequal inequality in that sense. 
uh, for more gender equal worlds. I guess that's kind of our commitment in this work. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. It's a it's a very deep working across all domains of change. So, mm -hmm. Smita or Sandrin? Smita? Hello. Yes, Sandrin. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, Thank Sandrin. You. Thank you. Yes, so I think our work has gone in the same length of uh, work also. Um, uh, and mainly to, like we say, yes, we want to eliminate violence, but it has to come uh, from youth also, not only people already engaged in this violence, but it has to come working with everyone, everyone at all levels, families, individuals, victims, but also engaging boys and men. So I think um, we're within our 16 days of activism campaign this this year, we have been really focused on that, on uh, having boys, men engage, and we've had a lot of panels in Haiti. We've had a lot of conferences where, yes, we do have uh, men, uh, women and girls come and talk about what is uh, gender-based violence, their experience, but we've also had a lot of role models, male role models, who have engaged with us and who have also talked about uh, um, other ways of empowering young men and having them change their behavior. So we've used a lot of male role models for this campaign also to get the message uh, passed out. Fantastic. Thank you. Smita? Uh, so involving influencer, male influencer into it, like police, the leaders, local leaders, the uh, the people who see them day and day, day out, and they um, seen as a protector, not the perpetrator, and they are supporting no violence, and they are talking about not doing the violence. So that is what I think method we have approached, and we have included them into the uh, neighborhood watch. They they are being promoted of this helping the uh, uh, the families to negotiate with the men they are the one who are helping them to report the violence to the police so that's the role you know male influencers are playing and they are becoming more active and they are advocating it and that and creating a model for others to follow it so that's the approach we have taken thank you samita charity I, I, uh, for us, I think especially as we are commemorating the 16 days, what I've also realized is that SK, we have actually partnered with uh, local organizations, was what we've also realized that at times we would not have the capacity to provide one-stop shop. So key lesson for that is is where we need to really uh, partner with local uh, uh, organizations and community-based organizations to also um, uh, raise uh, issues around GBV. And we have also realized that due to COVID-19, we have uh, learned that uh, we have uh, received quite a number of um, uh, cases around child marriage. So I think it actually presents an opportunity where some of these uh, norms are really uh, targeted. And also working through churches is platforms where some of these issues are raised is also critical. Over to you, Robin. Great, thank you so much, Charity. So um, in closing, I just, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. To our speakers, thank you for telling us about your important work. Um, and to the Cody Institute for supporting this webinar. Also, one thing that stands out for me in, 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 the, in the presentations from this morning, um, as well as the conversation is that how important it is to really uh, address how we, you know, social constructions of, of identity and, and challenging those and, and really being open and authentic. Um, to, to becoming a truer, better version of what it means to be a caring and active citizen, neighbor, and, and human. And so, you know, I just feel really honored to have shared this time with everybody today. And um, also, you know, the, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on the, on the Cody YouTube channel uh, for those who are interested in, in catching it later, or please also share it. 
Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Cody um, in regards to this issue. We are working in different areas around women's leadership, community development, asset-based citizen-led development, advocacy. So much of our work um, connects with, with the topics that came up in, in this discussion today. I also want to let people know that the Cody Institute is offering three new courses online in the beginning of 2021. The first two are starting in January. The one course is Conflict Transformation and Peace Building for Community Development, as well as the second course starting in January is Climate Change Basics for Community Resilience. And then later in March, we have a course starting on Introduction to Social Enterprise. So please feel free to check out the Cody education programs on the Cody website. Um, I wish you all a fantastic um, day uh, or night for <laughs> depending on where you are. Thank you for those uh, for Prabhu and Samita. I know it's quite late for you. Thank you for staying up for us um, to spend this time together. So thank you everybody. <laughs>